Ron Turner's Christmas, Christmas log. Fun stories and tales from beyond with special guest Skinner. I'm here with the great Ron Turner. This is the real uh, Turner Classics. I'm wearing my jacket because looking at me not wearing it makes him cold. So we're just here. But anyways, uh, we're here to regale you. I'm, I'm sorry. The fire department said no on open fires in the building. <laughs> no on open fires. So we don't have these lit. But we're going to talk about stuff and we're going to try to continue to make a, a, a series of Ron Turner stories for you for all time for everybody who can't uh, hear them just on the off day that you're hanging out with him somewhere. But you were saying, uh, before, we, before we go on, you were saying you came to my first show at the Minute Gallery. I did, I did. I, th I thought it was in the um, Technicolor Vomitorium. <laughs> Okay. Excellent. Excellent. That I mean, was that was just beautiful stuff, but I couldn't figure it out. Yeah. It was, um, and then you started working out. You know, some you left some. I know a lot of artists. They have their first, you know, show, big time show like that. Maybe you had others before then, but anyway, that was big time there. And you seemed to you had so much stuff, and then when you ran out of stuff, it seemed like you kept making stuff. And putting it up, and you, you you found distant corners with no lighting, and up above the the rafters, you were putting stuff up there. It was pretty amazing. I really liked it. <laughs> cool. But I, but I think everything sold in that show. A lot did, yeah. Jeez. Yeah, yeah it you, was. You went to as my dad used to say, uh, it it your artwork went through that uh, the crowd there like pumpkin pie, pumpkin pie through the hired help. <laughs> Yeah, they, I like. I, I think people were more into it than pumpkin pie for sure. Well, actually, there was no pie there. But if you would have had some pumpkin pie there, they probably would have the ignored the, the art. The simile was referring to the digestive system. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah, of, because they shit a lot. They were shitting. No, it went through quickly. <laughs> All right, it went through quickly. Yeah, there was a bunch of uh, sculptures. There was a bunch of like. I know we're sensitive because we're talking about your artwork. No, but it's okay. I don't. I don't mind it. But that it, it feels like a lifetime ago. At that, it was. That you, you were you were a, a pup. Then. Yeah, I was a young pumpkin pie pup. What they used to call me <laughs> on the street. <laughs> no, but uh, even as a pup, he had a crust on his pie. <laughs> so, so wait, so. You you saw that? Were, did you feel like that was sort of like? Uh, were you like, oh, this is a weird, this is a, this is a weird person, or this is weird art, monster art, this is trippy. I mean, I was so happy for you. Oh, thanks, man. It was a good moment. Another valley resident saved from obscurity. Yeah. It was good. Yeah, it was nice to be able to get out of Sacramento and do that. And then, like, and then the whole emphasis on horror, which I had at that point thought possibly was kind of, you know, uh, people backpedaling horror. It had, had a few bumps back in the 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, again, but it hadn't featured itself too much. Uh, a few luminaries like yourself. Uh, yeah, at that and, time, and, street art was the, the, becoming a, the big giant thing. Yeah, and... You know, like uh, the guy from Metallica really was into it and pushing it, and uh, a lot of you know, there was a real it was a handmaiden of the rock scene for sure. Yeah, yeah, I was uh, I was having a lot of global dread at that time. I was worried about the planet, and uh, I was kind of also I had just quit my job in two thousand eight in the middle of that. Uh, you'd you'd worked before. Yeah, yeah. I had a job. I worked with people with disabilities. I was an art, oh, okay. I, an so, artist. Yeah, I was an, an arts advocate. I kind of like had classes where I would not so much teach art, but hang out and try to give art supplies to people with developmental disabilities. And we would so, all hang so out. So you together. had a place where you could steal all these good ideas from, and they couldn't complain. <laughs> yeah, right? okay. I'd steal all the ideas and blame my farts on them. You <laughs> know what I mean? <laughs> Just kidding. About both things. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, but uh, 
Yeah, and then I quit my job, and then I was like, well, uh, I had landed that show there because I had sort of curated some shows, but I was like, well, if I'm going to do this for a living, I better make a giant splash once I have the chance. And it worked out miraculously, and I'm still doing horror. But you know, you know what's interesting is those installations that I was doing then were, if I was doing those now, people's minds would be like blown because nobody's really doing that stuff anymore. And at that time, my struggle was gaining footing in a world that was increasingly becoming enamored with street art and just like that kind of graffiti mural stuff like that. And I was all, yeah, if I do this other stuff, this like occult, psychedelic, horror, social commentary stuff that people thought was cool but it, it just didn't get a foothold and now I'm you know I don't really like galleries as much to to try to do that and I'm you know I'm I put I put so much energy into it that well I, I think also that most galleries have a tendency to say oh you're a good artist but you should do more in this area and you should do more in that area yeah and because we're the expert we understand things we're you know uh, higher, snootier level than you'll ever get. So yeah. we, we can represent you to the people that matter. Right. And the uh, problem is, is that your kind of work, they have absolutely no expertise in. Right. So you're beyond them already. So it's, I would see it would be kind of hard to find. Yeah, uh, it is hard <laughs> to home, deal. Yeah. Well, may I, well, I just want <clears throat> yeah. to interrupt. Uh-huh. Question from Yeah, Mark Colin. Said. I just thought, I just thought of something. What's that? All right, so in the early days of Last Gasp, mm -hmm. started as ecological comic book publisher. Yeah, eco funnies. Eco funnies, right? <laughs> but also, a lot of artists were doing horror themed things, and there's some kind of, you know. Yeah, I'm a man out of thing. time. <laughs> so you're like from that era, but you're not. I mean, you're doing your own thing, but yeah. what is that connection between the horror and ecology? It just seems, doesn't seem on the surface to have a connection. Well, what it's all, I mean, you know, it's, you, you could get super, you know, whatever, Joseph Campbellian, you know, Nietzschean, whatever, but like, you know, your man's connection to nature and death and all this stuff, but like, I mean, how do you, how do you live in this, how, how can you live in this world and not be constantly, you know, uh, preoccupied with horror and the ecology, you know, it's like the whole thing, but I think I do. It, it's weird because when I first started discovering underground comics, I immediately was like, oh shit, there's a population of people that share my same sort of misanthropic pulls. And not because I'm purposefully antagonizing the status quo, that comes, that comes later, but because I don't connect to the stream the current of like just people going along working every day being normal joes normies whatever it's not like i go oh and then all of a sudden everybody's expressing themselves in these ways and and becoming these weirdos you know i mean even i read like a you know rory hayes comics and i'm like this this is all this person has because their connection to the stream of normalcy is completely severed you know, and so it's, it's my, my only ability to survive this world, I guess, is to like, you know, talk, talk about it through my art or whatever, or just have a process that takes my mind off of how horrible it is, you know, <laughs> especially now that all you, you know, it's almost impossible to escape a news article about how shitty everything is, you know. Do you think that was the same sentimentality in, in, in the 70s? <laughs> Let me just cough first. <coughs> well, in the 70s, what led us to it was the, uh, you know, we foresaw the, the horror through, through science. It was pretty obvious. Uh, and we were also fighting a lot of battles like uh, DDT was still available and used back then. And they had such great charlatans. I remember there was a couple down in San Diego, kind of older looking, professorial looking couple that would go out and they would drink little vials of DDT to show you how safe it was. 
I've got to look back and find out whatever happened to those people. Did they die a horrible, screaming, agony death? Which I hope they did. Um, well, not really. That's not what the the babies turned turned out to be thalidomide babies or something. No, DVD. thalidomide was a was an other odd thing. It's like uh, science getting ahead of itself. Uh, there was a prom A lot of women complained of back aches and different things during pregnancy. So somebody came up with a drug that uh, eased their symptoms. But it was later they found that all of a sudden all these whole bunch of kids, especially in Europe, where the drug was more prevalent, uh, were being born without arms, without full arms, just stubs. And in the neonatal bath that they're living in, uh, the you, I mean you start exercising you know when you're before you're even defined as a as a life, and the idea is that without the pressure and the push, you don't develop your limbs. You have to do that, and so in the womb, with this women who were taking this drug, it would everything goes through the through the womb and it comes back out again through the placenta. The same they share the blood. And so they were getting a big dose of this drug that relaxed the muscles so they weren't working. So then they got born without arms. Thalidomide babies. Um, uh, Thalidomide baby jokes replaced uh, elephant jokes at some point in the 60s, I remember. Oh, really? Jesus. <laughs> They're like, what are you, some kind of thalidomide kid there? It's just like, what? That's The horror of it is actually very real. I know that wouldn't really fly. And that's why we have jokes a lot of times, is because it lessens the stark reality of the horror that's upon us if we can joke about it. It's very common for kids to joke about you know, harsh, evil things, and adults don't escape from it either. The first comic we did, the Slow Death Funnies, Richard Corbin did a great story about a really buff guy and a beautifully... Uh, uh, Sexually buff woman. Sexually buff woman. <laughs> uh, we're deciding to get away for the weekend and take their little robot flying car off to some place. And they went to. They wanted to be free and happy. And here they are bouncing on the on the sands, naked and bonking and happy. And uh, they said, "Oh, what do we need these pills for anymore?" And they threw them away. And they just felt so free and happy. And in the end, they wake up. Uh, uh, and they're just absolutely mangled, horrific creatures looking at each other because they're no longer uh, blinded by what the reality is. Uh, oh. and, and, and as well as they don't have the things to keep them going, so their flesh is already rotting away without their pills. Right. Yeah. So, so there's a good ecology horror thing. And all around them, instead of this beautiful paradise, it was just a, a big pile of uh, beachfront shit. <laughs> I think that's the thing is is you know like the humor like you say it's like the humor of trying to manage and negotiate the reality of stuff you know like that's oftentimes I will find that I'll be making really kind of dark humor jokes at parties and stuff and then I'll realize like oh yeah I nobody likes these jokes I'm or I'm too weird or too fucked up for these people you know what I mean like so I have to like go like I usually give it about 45 minutes or so of ascertaining like what the energy is of the environment and I'm like okay well I don't want to mess this up you know I <laughs> so I don't know it's weird especially if nobody's like oh you're just some freak artist person because usually you get the pass you know and the alternative to that is you might tell a really bad joke I know. <laughs> but wait, so yeah, Richard Corbin was good. He, he was like a good, uh, like, you know, he, he, uh, that was, that's kind of like the EC Comics uh, angle of exactly. stuff, right? Where it's like everything is what you think it is, and then all of a sudden at the end it's some hor horrible twist. Yes. I love that. And then I think almost 90% of the cartoonists that we ever published were influenced by EC Comics. Yeah, and uh, their their big artistic heroes, which they like to draw, were virtually all of them were from EC. Yeah, I love all those uh, anthology comics where you just have these amazing superstars like Greg Irons and Richard Corbin, and then 
um, Jackson and just like all, the, you know, I mean, it's like, you don't, I, I think I really lament the, the loss of that, like that old school <laughs> anthology where, you know, humanity is on parade for people, like how horrible, like the horrible twist or like the pettiness of somebody, you know, cause it's always like somebody leaving their, their husband for another guy who turns out to be a, a skeleton underneath his shirt or whatever, you know? And it's like, you got what you deserved, you know? It was always like humanity was put in line, you know? I miss that. I miss that kind of like stuff. But, okay, so wait, so you got, so somebody sent you some comics? Oh, here's a great story. Uh, don't worry about your past. It'll eventually come up and knock on your door. <laughs> okay. And uh, so... Uh, back in the early 70s, about 72 or so, 73, we had a, uh, a warehouse and office on at 1274 Folsom Street. And uh, although I had started Last Gas, at some point uh, to get more money, capital to expand and grow, which we were doing, and, but we just didn't have the cash to you know, continue keeping up with our demand with our publishing. So... Uh, I went into a partnership with a guy, uh, Bert Varga, and, uh, or Botond. And Botond's family was from Hungary, I believe, Eastern Europe. And the, the, all the, f the family members had been, or the older generation had been, uh, spies for the United States in World War II and belonged to the OSS, which was the predecessor of the CIA. And when things got dicey in Europe, after, when, especially when Russia took over everything that, almost everything that Germany was trying to conquer, um, they were spirited out to the United States. So along with uh, Bert uh, and his buddy, uh, Zintar Drobniks, his uh, parents also were doing that, they were doctors in Eastern Europe. And Zintar had a PhD in chemistry and Bert had uh, Masters in History, University of Chicago. They had bright guys. But they also uh, dabbled in things like they, they made a lot of LSD and they had a marijuana importing business. And I'd originally um, bothered Bert to lend me some money for to publish comic books, Slow Death Funnies. Uh, and he gave me a loan and I, I paid him back. And then later on, when he was getting out of the slammer for something, I mean, somehow a plain little weed got caught at the Oakland airport or something. Or one of his acid labs got turned, I forget. Anyway, at some point, he, um, uh, he kind of needed some help. And his uh, brother, who was a physics professor at Cal, wanted uh, me to help him out the best I could. So just to give him something to do, because after you spend any time in the slammer, you're you're, you're off your game a bit, so um, so we did. So we became partners, and then later on, as we became an incorporation, uh, Zintar got added into the mix. So we were all that, I, that was a corporation, but I had lost the fifty percent of it. So at some point there, the family told the their uh, Bert's and Zintar's lawyer, I guess last gas lawyer. Uh, we got to close down shop. Something's come up. Now, I don't know. I don't get. They don't send me the spy journals, and I have no idea what was going on. But something big was happening, and they had to. They said, you know, divest and get the hell out of there. So all of a sudden, I hear they're, they're trying to sell the company, and I said, but I'll, I'll buy it. And uh, they said, what, what would you want with it? I, said, I started. I'm still doing it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you want it, dude? Really? I mean, that was the stupidest thing I think anybody's ever said to me. Why would you want it? <laughs> so, um, as a precaution, uh, I decided to do a... Um, I had a friend from Scotland, uh, R uh, Robbie Robertson, not the musician, although he fancied himself one, um, and his buddy, Paul, and Paul had a friend down the peninsula who had gone to elementary school, middle school, and 
Aragon High School, and his fr and a bunch of them all lived in a farmhouse. And behind the farmhouse in San Mateo was a barn, a beautiful barn, built about 1902, clear cut red, you know, clear heart redwood, beautiful barn, nice, dry, well made. So uh, we, I figured out the rent was going to be really cheap. So I decided that was where I would. Do, so we got a big truck. And, unloaded the warehouse into the truck and took the truck down to San Mateo and put everything in this barn. We made several trips, so we got rid of all my stock. So in case they did do something silly like that, um, I'd still be able to continue on in business and they wouldn't know where I was at. Well, um, one fellow had a brother who lived at the place, Lenny, and Lenny didn't like, somehow Lenny and his uh, haze of dope smoking or whatever thought, <laughs> that barn's mine. Why do they have all this shit in my barn? He was just a renter at the house. So he went over and bashed the lock in and went inside and decided to cherry pick a bunch of things out of the barn, out of our boxes. Fast forward and uh, I get a phone call last week, and the guy says, hey, I've been trying to reach you, blah, blah, blah. And he told me the tale from his end, where the barn was and all that, and what his brother did. He said, oh, he's the one that broke the lock. Okay. He says, yeah, he says, but my brother died about 10 years ago, and I, I had this box which I put on a shelf in my house, and I've been guilty about it, and my bucket list was to give this back to you because it's you know, they're probably worth money now, but uh, I want to make sure that they're back to you. I don't want anything for them. So I said, fine, that's good. Wow. So we got this box, and I need to open it up. And Oh, meanwhile, I, I bought the all my employees chipped in money, and we managed to make a down payment and pay off all the people. And get, that's how last guests came back to me as so long. Damn. That's crazy. So this this box that you got in the mail is from the brother. No, no, no. He brought it in at seven in the morning. Someone got a phone call from him at seven in the morning saying, "Stand outside your warehouse." Oh my God! This so, is oh geez. So, so he, here's the he, box. He finally found me and then gave me this box in a Michelob box, no less. The Michelob and my Colin, my son here, notices it's the old UPS stamp that they used to put on things here. So, this so, is before computers. so you're probably going to be rich off these comics now. Oh, that's yeah. the cool part. Yeah, right. That the, the everlasting, enduring legend of somebody being like, I got somebody will always like show me this ratty stack of comics and be like, dude, you think these are worth something? <laughs> like, I sure do. What are they worth to you? You like Spider Man yeah. issue 573, which came out five years, six years ago? Yeah, let's give this man a, a razor blade. <laughs> uh, uh, my parole officer won't be very happy to hear that. It's a, it's a stack of Daffy Duck annuals. Oh my God, the, the one on the top. See, the Pardon first, Hitler. This, this, oh. think, this is an old Mad Magazine from... Oh, wow. It's number 172. Wow. Cents. Damn, what does it smell oh, like? Oh, why not pardon Hitler? Oh, my God. I don't want to smell it. You don't? Now here's a... Um, oh, it smells weird. It smells like an old lady's restroom. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> Looks like the rats have chewed that one pretty Snoyed good. Snoyed comics. Wow, dude, look at these. I want to see what this is here. This is a... Uh, Eight LPs. Yeah, but it's part of an old magazine. See, it's all turning to it's all turning to cornflakes. Oh, there we go. George Harrison's album. Okay, so this was sort of like a promotional thing for music, right? Yeah, this is probably some catalog. This is Oz Thirty One. God, when oh, it's Oz Thirty One. Okay, Oz was a magazine in, in England. Wow. It was since it was started by some Australian guy, uh, by name Anderson. The uh, Oz was the greatest uh, 
magazine that came out of England ever. It was just uh, beautiful. There's oh. a whole other story. We'll, we'll save that story for another thing. This is amazing. So, Snoid Comics was by Kitchen Sink. Okay. And these are these are kind of r red and whatnot. So, that's good. Oh, I thought they were all going to be mine, but this is good. Yeah, Kitchen Sink. Um, I got to hang Neve. out with Dennis there at the... These, I, these are kind of worth in the, like the $25 yeah, range, I sure. think, if, if you sell them. Meef. Oh, here's an old Bijou number two. Oh, this, yes. This could be like 50 or 100. Oh, I love them. Oh, good. This is kind of a rare one. Aardvark number two. Oh. And, oh, yeah. Uh, Bijou funnies. Love these. Great. Um, these are I cool. Hold these up for, oh, Taste. Tasty. This was a, from Washington, D.C. comic. Oh, good. I see a junk over here. Oh, wow. The cover is wild. Ah, uh, junk comics. Junk was a great comic. There was a guy that lived over by Divisadero and Haight Street, and his pets were all iguanas. <laughs> and he'd go to his house, and you sit there for a while, and uh, oh okay, sometimes you have to sit for a while because he, I think he and everybody else were junkies that were his friends. <laughs> and so this is a, a comic book about uh, doing junk. Oh, wow. And uh, <laughs> I remember, like, near him, there was, like, it was mostly ghetto area at that time. And what happened with the, with the ghetto area was, I remember there was a, a barber shop down, down this corner named New Bills, which was a convenient name. If there's already a bill in the family of an African-American family back in those days, uh, the new kid, if they wanted to name him William, was called New Bill. <laughs> not, not to be confused with the old bill. No, new bill. New bill. So there was a, a barber shop, a black barber shop. I, I like some of the uh, Guy Caldwell stories about heroin addicts oh, and stuff. Oh, well, yeah. I love this one, Armageddon. Armageddon. It's a very sexy comic. Armageddon was wonderful. It was Barney Steele. This is a number one. Barney Steele was a was a a U.S. Navy SEAL. Whoa. And I would go out and party with the SEAL guys. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, were they intense? Oh, yeah, yeah, they're intense. And they told me some of their, their crafty things that they had to do in training. One was getting a night dropped out of a helicopter into the ocean with a 44-pound pack on their back. And there were two of them, and they had to figure out where shore was and and go to the, um, swim to the shore in the night and get on beach and find each other and then reassemble the, the backpacks, which were a small nuclear weapon then. Wow. Yeah. So, and this was back in the 60s, and, you know. So it was like probably real rudimentary machinery and stuff, and like. Oh yeah, we're talking about EC Comics. This was like a parody uh, kind of thing. Of the, the haunt of fear. I mean, this was a uh, they. There was a company that reprinted all the EC Comics. Yeah, the old witch. Oh yeah, ghastly. So he, old ghastly. In a way, I think he didn't. Um, I think Lenny didn't just cherry pick from the boxes. He took certain boxes that were. Uh, well, we had we had stuff that was that we were distributing, so we had all these other people's comics. Yeah. Oh time. yeah, so you had was, a lot of people. Yeah, I was just thinking we had most of our own, but we didn't. Like this was uh, Dave Sheridan, Mothers, and Frank and uh, Fred Schreier. Mothers Oats was a brilliant production from Ripoff Press. Wow. That, that really showcased these guys' talent. They were just amazing. When they came out to San Francisco, they called their ride out uh, in this dilapidated car the Overland Vegetable Stagecoach. <laughs> All right. That's a Wally here's Wood another, cover. Here's another huh? Wally Wood. Yeah, this is a reprint from EC Comics. So, uh, And Bent. Oh, good Bent. This is an S. Clay Wilson. S. Clay's still kicking. He's barely kicking, but he's kicking. Only now he can't kick very much. Kicking in his mind. Here's skull number four. <laughs> See, we've already gotten... 
You know what I love about Did this? This this is amazing. Yes, because it has HP Lovecraft adaptations in it. Yeah. I love this one. Yeah, I got uh, I got permission from some of those people on a postcard. Oh really? Oh good. This is a uh, Dave, uh, Dave Geyser was one of the first underground cartoonists. He was oh, when I met him, he was already printing his own comic books. When I was going down to visit uh, Warren's Waller Press, which was on Howard Street, he was already there doing stuff in, in some of it in color. This is black and white. But he turned into a rather robust, abstract painter, and that's essentially what he does. He just did a whole series of mushrooms that he gathered in the forest and kind of attached them to his paintings. As he a show up. <laughs> Maybe those that galleries piece. that don't like me will like him. You think? Uh, they'll def I should, they definitely like him. I should glue some mushrooms he, on the he stuff. He keeps marrying movie star women, too. I don't know. <laughs> that helps. Mr. Natural. Mr. Natural Chrome at his best. And then Mickey Rat, Robert Armstrong. is great. Mickey Rat. Yeah. We finally got sued for, <laughs> for Mickey Rat by Disney. Disney? They, they thought that that was besmirching the good name of Mickey Mouse? Yeah, but I mean, we got, I'm not, not sued, I got sued by them for publishing a comic book that besmirched Mickey Mouse. Ah, don't try to besmirch now, him. Now, this is, this is an example of something, okay, funny book, this guy was hilarious. Uh, and not, not what it's, you see, he says, look, God reads this comic book, right? <laughs> now, this guy, uh, when I was... What finally got me out of living in a warehouse and living on Haight Street, or near Haight Street in a commune, was um, a little, I, I had a little in-betweens, but I, where I couldn't live in warehouses anymore, I had to live with people. And uh, I was living on, at, we had a place, we moved to San Francisco on 320 10th Street. And I had a room up in the upstairs, the mezzanine that was my bedroom, and we had phones all out over there. And I had a, we had a printing company that we started called Pentagon Press, which shows uh, the signature with that is a small drawing of a of a devil inside a pentagram, pentagram press. It's my kind of press. I know you're kind of. <laughs> it was great. We had a 36-inch Harris press. And sometimes we'd have SETI coming down on Saturdays. To, I let him use up the plates and print things. Dumb me, never kept any of the plates or his output of his work. He just was having, he was a wonderful collage artist, SETI. And it was a great place. Well, one morning the phones were ringing out there like crazy, so I got out of bed and I came out and I answered one phone and I answered another phone. And this is when you had these multiple sets on desks. We had about four or five lines, and I was just, oh, I couldn't believe it. I smelled coffee, and I heard the press start up downstairs. Somebody made coffee. Great. So then, <laughs> so then some people come up the stairs and say, hey, Ron, we have a meeting with you? I said, sure, come on up. And they, look, they, they kind of stopped in the middle of the stairs. He says, well, uh, sure, come on in. It's great. Uh, we'll come back later. Really? No, come, no, really. I'm free. Phones aren't ringing. No, bye. And they, they took off. Uh, that's odd. And then I realized I'm stark naked. <laughs> what? A big, you, long beard, long hair. Yeah, you look like Pews. Mr. Natural, huh? Oh, man. I don't know what I look <laughs> like. Look These guys, <laughs> they didn't want any part of it. There was a group of them. <laughs> You didn't like you, so you're like, yeah. I vowed at that time. I said, okay, no more warehouse living from now on. This is like crazy. Yeah, you get a little detached from normal stuff. But, I know but that. This guy <laughs> sued me in small claims court, <laughs> not for being naked or for offering him who knows what he was getting, because he said I didn't pay him his royalties. Well, the guy was a kind of a, a okay artist, but he was, you know, he, I don't think he got above a D minus in math. Right, <laughs> and uh, like most artists, Fluger and uh, Flug, Flug, and <laughs> we went to the. I had to make a court appearance to the small claims, 
and the judge is going, you know, he's going through various cases, you know, like a, like a buffet lunch, and he's, we're, you know, sitting there, finally our case gets up there, and he says, he says, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> he said, <coughs> so we're in the courtroom, and the judge looks at something, and he kind of smirks, and he says, the almighty publishing company versus last gasp of Ego Funnies of San Francisco. He looks back at his paperwork and he says, he says, can you guys sort this out before we do anything, please? <laughs> That's funny. He didn't and, want to deal no, with it. No, I, I uh, in my great math skills, I said, okay, you know, we sold this much, this is how much we took in, this is what his royalty was per book sold, this is what I, here's his canceled checks, he's been paid for everything, I don't know what he wants. I was do more for my works. Case dismissed. Damn, so he thought he should deserve more because he was a genius? Yes, I hope that he's up there with God showing God his comics. Right <laughs> I think he's up there trying Thrills, to... Thrills, chills, and good clean sex. <laughs> Let's look at this. Well, the art's pretty good. <laughs> you know, for a Christian. Dude, it's so great. It's just Archie ripoff comic stuff. Oh. That's pretty... Well, there's a few. Let's see. Well, Pudge Lee Mars did a wonderful bunch of comics. And she based this kind of on her teenage years, her angst of being a chubby teenager. So she had this strip about a teenage girl named Pudge the Girl Blimp. Uh -huh. This was really good. And see. this this might, I don't know, is this, what issue is this? She, I know she had th about three of them. Before she stopped? I mean, the, you know, it's the further fattening adventures of Pudge. You know what's crazy to me is how much effort goes into the art in one of these underground comics and that the fact that everybody was kind of doing their own thing and putting in so much work and that, I mean, the, the just this set, set of pages right here, is more oh, yeah. than any Marvel comic. Like, this is so much work. Like, one of these pages has got to be, like, a week to do or something. You know? It, it blows my mind how much effort... It go I mean, you know, I'm too... I look at this stuff, and I'm like, I'm not going to do any comics. I'm too lazy, man. Uh, happy endings. Jack Jackson. Uh, Jackson might have been... It's kind of a toss up between Jackson and Joel Beck as to be the first underground cartoonist. Joel Beck was doing stuff at Cal when he was still in high school. They didn't know he was in high school, but he kept going over to the newspaper office and he would slip things under the door for the Pelican, which was the Cal humor magazine. And he ended up winning a national award for humor. He did Lenny Laredo. Loosely based on Lenny Bruce, and wow. uh, but then they they couldn't find him on campus, and then they found out later that he was still a high school student in El Sobrante. So Jackson wow. Jackson was at the University of Texas with Gilbert Shelton and made up the crew, along with Dave Moriarty and uh, Fred Todd, who was not from Texas, uh, that made a ripoff press, which started in 1969. And Gilbert had been a great contributor to the. University of Texas uh, Humor Magazine in Austin, and they all came out. But anyway, this was a good uh, strip. It has this nice... Jackson was a historian and did a tremendous amount of historical uh, research in books. Yeah, uh, all the Jackson stories, uh, underground comics that I would get from you guys were just crazy historical lessons about like the invasion of the Philippines or um, Native American battles. And here's a here's a guaranteed uh, illegal comic. This was banned by Disney. We uh, this was the second issue. I think this is the first. Air pirates. The first. 20s. The first reason I didn't recognize. A thing I thought that would make them rarer was when we had misprints, and if the misprint went all the way through, it got. You know, the covers got uh, stapled onto a book. I thought that he'd be worth a lot more. But uh, 
Well, that, that market hasn't shown up yet. So, but this is, <laughs> but Air that, pirates. But, but this is our, uh, this case went all the way to the Supreme Court. And when they were told to pay three quarters of a million dollars, all the artists turned around and says, hey, it wasn't us, it was Turner, he published it. Oh, shit. And so uh, I got nailed with the verdict. and uh, So you had to pay three mil? Three quarters of a mil. Oh, three quarters. Whoops, sorry. Back in, the, which in today's rate would be about 10 million, I think. Like that. Did you have to pay that for real? I made an agreement with Disney, a private agreement. Since there's no books out on this thing, I can say what I... My agreement was that I would not do anything more anti-Disney for 10 years. <laughs> Pretty good. If, Pretty good. If we both pay our own legal fees and fines, so That's, I didn't have to. So I had to pay this lawyer this money. Okay. For representing him, it was like twelve hundred bucks or something. Oh, that's not bad. Not bad for a Supreme Court case, but I didn't get the credit for it because all the publicity was gone by the time I got nailed. So. Damn. So, okay, another Bijou comic from. I read a whole uh, research and, and thing. This is something that Skinner would like. It's yeah. Speed Freak Man. <laughs> I saw that in there and I was like ready. I was like waiting to be able to like look at it. <laughs> Speed uh, Freak. This was an interesting one. Uh, this was done with Gary Arlington and S. Clay Wilson. And they went down to uh, Garrett's pretty company over here. And... Uh, was thrilling murder, and one of the things was when Wilson was over there in the. Um, oh, that's good. He was screaming bloody murder. You can imagine how Wilson can scream bloody murder. <laughs> but they'd ask for red ink for the to because there was eight pages that would have blood in it on the on the pages. Oh. On the inside, so it wasn't a full color, but it had spot color on on one of the signatures. So, the problem was is that. In the magic of printing, you use a what's called a cold red, so it's kind of a purplish red color, and then you mix a certain amount of yellow underneath it, and that makes it pops it being a nice red red. So this is like putting 100% yellow and 100% red, and you get this nice toasty red, tomatoey bloody red. But if you don't have that, you get kind of a purpley red. And Wilson was running around screaming at all these. Indian printers who were from uh, South Pacific uh, screaming at them because they were making his blood look like Kool-Aid. So oh, he didn't like that. It was a scene. It was a scene. S. Clay screaming around town once again. Now we have turned out cuties. This was Jay Lynch. Yeah. Jay just passed, sadly. Mm -hmm. Great man. Those, uh, those two best friends. One, one of the original uh, Cheech Wizard, which I think this might have been Company and Sons. It was. Company and Sons was an early underground comic book printer. And uh, and if Last Gas Printment or Rip Off Press wouldn't print it, Company and Sons would. And at the time, people, I think, didn't really, weren't really into like Cheech Wizard stuff that he was doing, but. Um, later we warmed to him and then producing his stuff too. Uh, Roger Brand, uh, he was Wally Wood's inker for a while. And he did this series also, which he included other people in. Tales of Sex and Death. <laughs> and that's about My favorite. Yeah. My and favorite. Another, uh, Wow, dude. When Barney was working on this, Barney still was working on this issue of Armageddon, he was at a studio set up a few doors down from Last Gasp at a, uh, a wholesaler of kimchi. And he, his, he rented this little space for virtually nothing between two gigantic vats of kimchi. <laughs> And we went out there and said, Barney, it's almost impossible to stay here with this fucking reeking, rotting cabbage on either side of you. He said, yeah, but the rent's right. So we sit there and draw this crazy fucking sex. 
Oh, oh my God. God. <laughs> Two gigantic bat, bats of bubbling cabbage beside him. And uh, nobody would believe this, but it was true. And I went down to one place, someplace I've got some photographs of the, the, this family was doing pretty good. They were all Koreans. And they got their toho in America by making this rotting gunk, which I love to eat with Korean food. But uh, most people are offended by it. And the, uh, they decided that they could, they were, what they did is they were exporting to Korea the antlers of various animals from America. And they would have people going out, scouring the fields and mountains and everything in you know, where the antelope roam and where the moose and elk roam. And they would bring back truckloads of this and they had a small elevator to go upstairs where they stored all this stuff behind Barney's vats of bubbling cabbage. And I got some pictures of whole truckloads of antlers coming in. And then one of them had a bright idea, why don't we just get a herd, a breeding herd, and take it to Korea, and then we can have antlers there, you know. They shed their antlers, or we can kill them for the meat and take the antlers. We have a large enough herd, so all, the entire family is all pitched in, had a huge amount of money, and they went out and they somehow managed to buy an entire herd of, of uh, horned animals. And they, air, <laughs> they had to air, air transport them back to Korea. Oh my god. And so they were like on. Um, Boy, they were on cloud nine then, or whatever the number is in Korean. <laughs> and they were like out, with they had the whole thing going out there. Sadly, the kind of grass that they were feeding on was indigestible by the herd. Oh. And so they all died. Oh, shit. That's what so green So they all had to like, you know, go back to Korea, I guess, I don't know, be executed. I don't know what happened to them. They were like, we never saw them again. That was a great block, 1,200 block at Folsom. Yeah. Oh, there, look at this. Who's that? Crusher Creel. The Absorbing is. Man. He's about to smash Thor. This is like a Thor comic without the cover. Illustrated by the... He looks the, like a pinhead too, doesn't he? He does, yeah. yeah. He's, he has that criminal brow. He has well, here, that here's, criminal... Here's one I never thought that Pritman would sell out of, but they did. Wow. Living Dolphins? What is it? The dying, the dying dolphins. The dying dolphins. This is another kind of attempt at a, ancient secrets. Um, an ecology comic. That, so we had our imitators also for our stuff. Yeah, I um, I I would watch a bunch of documentaries about Bobby, dolphins dying. Bobby London. It's sad. Well, this is a good one actually. Bobby London came Merton of the movie. Um. He had a bunch of good comics things, but a lot of his stuff looked a lot like really old-fashioned comics, uh, things that uh, Seeger would draw or whatever. Uh, but there's some other good things in here. There was a little strip of Trots and Bonnie by Sherry Flanagan, who ran for a long time in National Lampoon, was in here. I think Bobby and Sherry might have been friendly. Right? You mean it had oh, sex? Big League Left. This is the first comic book about pro sports. Person. <laughs> My <laughs> favorite. Jim Go Hines, team. Jim Hines, who did everybody, he made all animals out of all of his yeah. characters. Big League Laughs. Big League Laughs. And, uh... Do you laugh? Well, there's a severed... Pain that, uh, is that a, it's just a, oh, it's you can sad. project into anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, I think that Jim's still alive. He and his wife, Buffy, um, he became a, a therapist. I agented a the book of his, a, a, a coloring book for dads, for divorced dads. <laughs> the Straight Arrow Press came out of Rolling Stone and a music publishing company, Music Sales. And their spawn was Straight Arrow Press, which John Goodchild had been doing the artwork for Rolling Stone and worked on. He was also, Goodchild was a member of the Oscar, the Oz magazine that you had. 
And it was just a, a great thing. I knew that the, this guy, Rensler, who was uh, the guy who mostly looked over Hunter Thompson's shoulder and guided him when they were doing books of his stuff early on. Alan Rensler, though, was the publisher at Straight Arrow. And I knew that he'd been recently divorced, so I went in and pitched him this book because I knew he couldn't resist it. And uh, he went for it, of course, and so Jim had a, a, contra had a book published by this early on, 72 or so. But it was like one of the first, you know, co coloring books that was focused on uh, social issues, which led to the, eventually to the gigantic craze where there's been 100,000 different co color books done, very possible. What, what, was it, what was some of the pages in the divorced dad? Divorced? Oh, the dad cooking dinner for the kids, the dad taking them on a camping trip. The dad, but, like, but, but they how's were, your mom? But they, but they were all drawn as animals, so they were like, uh, you know, they were human in form, except that they were like had animal heads. Okay. Well, that's not as fun as just like an overweight dad. And this this is a, a classic kitchen sink kind of. Uh, you know, they were back in Wisconsin, although Dennis was from Texas, but in Princeton, Wisconsin, in the Fox River Valley. And so they had uh, mom's homemade comics. I like this drawing style. Looks kind of like it could be a predecessor to like. Well, here's the back cover uh, of one of Crumb's comics, which we made into a bunch of po we made these into posters, or Don Donnie did, and we copied it. Oh yeah. So a Tommy Toilet says. And then stoned again. Don't forget to wipe your ass, folks. And then stoned again is on the other side, which is a perfect... Uh, this was done in uh, color and sold tremendously well. We made t-shirts out of these also. Yeah. Black light. I see it was like a black light poster. And then early zap. Ooh! Early there you zap go. here. And... Uh, There was number one, and then there was, uh, which was all crumb, and then there was number two, which he brought people in with him. But he'd done an earlier comic called Zap, which, we, which was then numbered Zap Zero, because it was, had been lost, and then finally found. So to keep it in continuity, Zap Zero, one, and then two. So this is the first appearances of S. Clay Wilson and a bunch of others. Yeah, Rick Griffin. <laughs> Like yeah, Rick Griffin, Moreno, um, yeah. Moscoso. Moscoso. I can't read the cursive. Oh, it's right. like, who's Moreno? <laughs> Moscoso. Zippy Moreno, fantastic. remember him? Moscoso is a fantastic, yes. fantastic uh, poster artist. And this was the, uh, the, f the first Fanagore that was in color. This is my probably absolute favorite underground comic artist, Richard Corbin. I guess he was discouraged by how hard it was to do this. So this was um, Snatch Comics, which also gave you a, besides the obviously uh, gracious cover with Angel Food and Spade on it, um, gave a, a self-plug to buy this comic because you could jerk off with Snatch Comics on the back. Um, Perfect. This, they, everybody wanted like a, a, a real sex comic, a really dirty sex comic. But, uh, but the guys were doing it from an artistic standpoint and there was a show in Berkeley they got busted. Uh, the Zap show in Berkeley got busted at this gallery over there. And uh, so things were a little dicey at that time. But, but because of that, companies like big, good bookstores like City Lights used to carry all the underground comics because they were banned books. Dang, there's some, this, this one has some <coughs> like gnarly stuff. These like Rory Hayes drawings in here are just crazy. <laughs> and here we have the original Slow Death Funnies. 
In the back, you'll see uh, this was Willie Mendez did a nice mandala. Oh and, wow, and that's the, a good one. The first uh, first story. I want. Should we? Do you guys want to call the? I'm just a big stack here. We could, we could, two. we could, we could, we could do, do part two. two. It's yeah. up to you. I don't want. I mean, if you're I just, just saw this one, it's what it does interesting because I had never seen, I've never actually seen this one. So. Okay. Yeah. American Flyer. American Flyer was a uh, comic by Larry Wells, and he was he he was one of the earliest underground cartoonists that got published by Printment, and he had a series called Captain Guts, which was like a superhero. Looking not unlike the Incredibles these days, had virtually the same costume that they had. We find a lot of thieving from the major animators by early cartoonists in the underground because they think nobody knows about this stuff, and they kind of like easily fleece things off. Like R two D two and Star Wars was a complete ripoff of uh, Larry Todd's work, where he had a, a, a robot. Very much the same. That you use Doctor Atomic's companion. So yeah, so uh, Larry Wells did this. Larry Wells was from Bakersfield, and when I did Bakersfield Country Comics, which I hope is in the box, um, love this. Cover. He and Larry Southern the only used artists from Bakersfield to do Bakersfield Country Comics. Wow, this is good. You know who else I like is Zippy Moreno. <laughs> There's a good one by Mr. Moreno right here in the back. Um, so, yeah, we can continue. We can go through these. We could we could continue this later too. Oh, look at this whole Earth catalog. Whoa, what's this? Wow. Weird trips, holy shit! <laughs> wow. Now, yeah, let's, let's just hold this stuff off. For All right, but do okay. So let's say let's continue this. We'll talk more about underground comics and, and your stories and stuff. But it's almost Christmas, so I was wondering if you had any um, any cool Christmas stories. Said Reagan wins. <laughs> I was thrown out of the way, but maybe there's some. I usually have things for a reason. Information. Yeah, he's trying to see what the correlation is between this piece of paper. Have it with secret gin. Oh yeah, that might actually just be a ripped out page out of that book no, right no, there. No, no, that's that was the internet of the. Oh, that was the internet of the yeah, of this the, pre the whole Earth catalog. This is the internet from the past. Oh, wow! It really is. It's, it's all this like random information. Oh, oh my God! Sharks, jets, plastics, and buildings, engines, formulas, chainsaws. Whoa! This is this is crazy. Wow. You never know. It's always wise to have a bottle of black and white whiskey in the home. You never know when it's wanted or for entertaining. In a nightcap, to make sure if your sound restless sleep as a restorative after a tiring day or an effective safeguard against colds and chills, black and white is plenty from the richest reserves of old whiskey in Scotland. Put it down on your shopping list today. I've never heard of that kind of whiskey in my life. Black and white, they, have, they usually have these, I think they have these Scotty dogs, the black and white Scotty dogs. Oh, yeah, that sounds good. Scotty dogs make me want to drink whiskey. Just like pirates make me want to drink rum. What, do you got any Christmas stories? Any weird ones from the past? You got any like Christmas parties that have been ruined by any weirdos? You got any? Well, Rusty was on the canal dogs? at Bardsley by a man and his wife. <laughs> We're walking along the town's path. Wilhelmina Lindsay 
age 26, single and of Sandy Lane, Dayton, appeared in a special court at Ashton Uber, Ashton Under Lynn yesterday. She was charged with the murder of her six-year-old son, Edgar Lindsay. <laughs> On Saturday night, the woman was found in the water after she was pulled out by a man after she was uh, had been rescued. She said that her son was also in the water. The boy's body was recovered. Lindsay was then remained in custody until tomorrow. Tomorrow, Tomorrow. Christmas, Christmas Day. Day. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. All right. Well, let's. Uh, thanks, Ron. We'll we'll come back and then we'll talk more comics. What, what was it about Christmas? You said. Oh, I don't know. Did you do you have any cool Christmas stories or any cool ruined like any Christmas parties where somebody came in and you know ruined it? Do you got any weird? Because you know so many weirdos. You you've known every weirdo who's ever lived. They just gravitate towards you like a magnet. Got any good ones? Well, you that one Christmas time, stories like, like like the one time Jim Morrison drank all your black and white whiskey and then he took a well, dump okay, in your bathtub. Like the burritos, beers, cheers. Oh, I don't know anything. Any, well, that, any. That's, your, that's our Christmas. Okay, story. yeah, you got any good ones? Well, I do remember that we used to at the burritos beer and cheer party. We, had, we didn't have beer much. We had some beers. But I always brought about uh, 15 bottles of whiskey in, a very, in different spirits and just put them out with ice and mix and things and people would mix their own. Well, the problem was is at the end of the party, there'd be like five or six people laying on the ground passed out. And everybody else, of course, says, hey, see you, Ron. And uh, I just spent an hour or so cleaning up and some of these guys would wake up and you'd kick them every now and then when you walk by. Some of them would <laughs> Excuse me, sir. You can't stay here. I didn't say excuse me. Okay. <laughs> it was implied. Fucking assholes. <laughs> so, um, then the problem was getting him out of the thing. So I'd have to drag him out, throw him in my van, and what to do with him? I didn't know where they lived. Take him to the tender was, No, no, I took him down to a bus stop down on Michigan <laughs> And just stacked them. You stacked them high. <laughs> At the bus stop. Back then, they were like little houses, right? The buses ran later. They were hoping to walk back home, but they got to do a bus stop. Oh, yeah. Yeah, get on the bus, buddy. See ya. Well, that's pretty cool. So after that began to happen frequently, I decided not to bring out the hard whiskey anymore, just bring the wine and beer. Uh, <laughs> and the bodies didn't. We had one idiot who was uh, Jim Todd. Rest <laughs> in peace, Jim. Wherever. Rest in peace, Jim. Rest in peace, wherever he um, may be. No, he's, he's, he's down in hell. Yeah, he was a... Uh, he was living in a commune of uh, skinheads huh. when I hired him. Ugh. He was an artist, and he got a few pieces of his work around here. But uh, one Christmas uh, party, we had Jerry Garcia came to our party. It was great. Sweet. We were in the uh, 2180 Bryant building. And some people just don't have the brains that they were born with. And but he, came, he went up to Jerry and told him, says, hey man, your music's not so good. <laughs> and then Jerry just karate kicked him, right? Jerry should have, but Jerry, you know. He's like, he's like that's uh, your opinion, man. I was hoping Jerry would just show him this trick where he'd show, like, you know, he'd throw the, the finger coming off with his hand with the finger missing. <laughs> yeah. But he didn't do it. <laughs> You feel like that would have been a good reply? If <laughs> he goes, hey man, your band's not that good. And then he goes, hey, check this out. And he shows up with a finger. That's what I was doing, didn't it? It's all, look at my finger. <laughs> so, it's such a good reply. 
to any confrontation. <laughs> I'm gonna remember that when somebody has like some kind of problem with me. I'm like, hey, have I ever showed you this trick before? Well, let me catch your finger out first. Just so, saw it down. I don't know. We've had many uh, uh, crazy uh, trips here. Um, it's amazing what a little celebrity will do, though, because uh, we've had various celebrities over the years. But people sometimes ask me, what celebrities are going to be there this year, Ron? Oh, jeez. Well, I don't know. You're going to be here, aren't you? <laughs> Make them feel good? Yeah, sure. Well, I guess, like, I mean, for me, I, I, when I would come... I was more anonymous at the time, which I still am somewhat anonymous except for the internet, you know, but uh, I would show up and I would be just, my mind would be blown because, you know, Mark Ryden would be here, Robert Williams and his wife, or, you know, Marion Peck was Mark Ryden's partner. I would just be like, oh my gosh, you know, I mean, even Junko Mizuno was like one of the first times I ever met her was here, and I was completely blown up. Oh my God, I just met Junko Mizuno. And now we just hang out and, you know, talk and eat food and drink and stuff. But like, well, that, that it really the, was that, fun that's here. That's the kind of thing that, uh, which is fun is that almost all people that I know who are celebrities uh, are, are just regular people and uh, they're just happy to have a great conversation with you without yeah. having to... Uh, do your finger trick. <laughs> everybody is just a person, and that's the problem with uh, any kind of social examination of the celebrity stuff. Like, I, all my, like, my friends that desire the most normal interactions are people that are like celebrities, musicians or actors or whatever. They're just looking for that like, basic humanity. Jerry, Jerry was like a, a Jerry was a friend. I, I met Jerry when they played in Fresno back in 66, 67. And I had a little underground newspaper down there called uh, The Grande Delecto, which means caught in the act. And the front cover was, if anybody ever sees this and has found a copy, uh, it's worth uh, more than 100 bucks to me to see that. And, uh, but the front cover, it was all mimeographed this in the olden, olden days. And we had a, the front cover was a, a, a Christ on a cross going 69 and another Christ on a cross. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it turned out that that was a little rich for Fresno. Not, not, not the, the liberal, liberal headquarters, headquarters that Fres Fresno is. <laughs> so um, that hastened my departure to San Francisco. Uh, so, but I was covering the, the, the Grateful Dead's appearance in Fresno, and at the end, everybody had this. I remember Pig Pen just got into this gigantic bowl full of mostly watermelon cut up and different things, and just eating it was great and. Uh, but they were kind of stuck because the cabs in Fresno were kind of dinky and hard to find. So I offered to give them a ride, and I guess somebody else could, because there was you know, too much for my car to get a Volkswagen. And so uh, Jerry and I went, and we were on the way out to the airport. Uh, Jerry said, so, so Ryan, he says, how, how many hippies are there in Fresno? I thought about it, was, uh, I think it was 43. <laughs> Jerry goes, oh. Anyway, we can't. <laughs> so, so we got to the airport. We were all so, and um, the airport was like one of these, you know, like a third world country. One of the first things that they do when they make a big gambit into the big time is they build an international airport. Even though they may not have an airline, they build an international airport. And Fresno was no exception. They, they needed a beautiful stones from the Sierras on the walls, cavernous place with all these different airlines were going to be in. There was like maybe two airlines that were there. And my friend Dave Lennon was at one of them when we came into the airport late at night. But to save energies, since nobody was there with this one airline, the only thing that was lit up was the United Airlines booth. 
And you walk in and it's just there, it's dark. You can see some people in the dark shadow areas around waiting for the plane. And so then they come with the Grateful Dead and we go to the, <laughs> go to the uh, counter. It's my old high school buddy, Dave Lennon, who before I hadn't seen much since he left for the Coast Guard after the night that we spent driving him down the sidewalks of downtown Fresno in his car. You know, broken and the skunks. And anyway, so Dave was there. He was, he was handling all the baggage and tickets and things. And we got the dead square away and we were sitting up there. And then we looked over and our eyes were adjusting to the darkness. And we could see that the only other people in the place besides the group of dead that was all dressed up in you know, their performance clothes for the flight back to San Francisco was guys who were returning back to their units after being home from the Vietnam War and they had on all their dress uniforms. And if you've ever seen a stare down in your life, it's a bunch of crazy hippie musicians looking, staring down a bunch of guys who are going back to the action of, of, of the Vietnam War. That was a tense, tense, tense uh, night at the Fresno Air Terminal also known on your little tickets as FAT. Uh, you know, everybody's got a little slogan. Fat, for yeah, fat. Fresno Air Terminal. That's funny. Yeah, we, we always wanted BART to go down there so we could call it BART, could call it FART. <laughs> <laughs> but the city council rejected that. <laughs> Although we did bring it up. So I guess, yeah, those people were like going back to Vietnam and they're like, these are the... Free people, the people whose you're freedoms your life that for. we're fighting right. for, yeah, gonna, we're fighting. It's like, yeah, you're I know. Gonna take a bullet for this guy. Yeah, for wavy for, gravy. For I'm kid. taking a bullet for wavy gravy. You gotta be kidding well, me. Wavy was. A I know, I know. I just for Jerry. Hugh Romney. You mean, <laughs> you mean Hugh Romney? <laughs> no, they look over. They look over. I'm taking a bullet for this guy. And there's Jerry Garcia with his finger. He's like going like this. Yeah, I. I they wouldn't take me before. Uh... <laughs> well, cool, man. Well, let's uh, we'll get together soon, and we'll continue the the underground comics talk. And I'll bring some black and white whiskey. Um, maybe. <laughs> maybe not. I probably have some here. Yeah, let's find it. Let's have Colin, the whiskey child, to yeah. go get us. He hasn't some. had a cold all year. Has he? No, that's good. He I sleeps do, do well at night. All right, so. Stay tuned next time and for the further adventures. <laughs> what? <laughs> what is this? You got a woman's de decaying pantyhose inside of your jacket. <laughs> what is all this shit? <laughs> oh, wow, the pork pie hat has decided to, to, to decay before our eyes. I thought you, you know what? I thought you had like a wound on your head and these were like bandages. I was like, oh, I, I guess he must have fallen. I like, this, cracked his nugget. This nut is hit. an absolute perfect English bowler's not Yeah, a bowler, not a pork pie hat, a bowler's hat. Jesus. This is a real one. I'd like to solve a crime with Sherlock Holmes. Now you look like Laurel and Hardy. <laughs> I do look kind of like that, that, the Laurel guy, the skinny guy. All right, that's it for today. Thank you for joining us. This concludes another episode of Ron Turner's Christmas Log with special side friend Skinner. Please join us again for more episodes in the future. And don't forget to support Last Gasp, Eco Funnies, and your local comic book store and any freak you see on the street. Give them a dollar because they need to buy shampoo for their filthy hair. Thank you very much. Talk to you soon.